It's September 23rd, 2021. This is Rook. She is an Afghan-American actress who made a big impression with her riveting role as Samira Nouri in the final season of the hit series Homeland. And between dancing and modeling and fluently speaking six languages, she has also scored a starring role in the new sitcom The United States of Al. But Sitara Atsai has also been outspoken about events in her homeland of Afghanistan and supporting Afghan women and girls. Sitara joins us for a feature interview today, plus film critic and documentary documentarian Araf Mohammadi on the current state of Iranian cinema during festival season. This is conversations from, to, and about the Iranian diaspora. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode 147 of Rook. Nice to be talking to you. Hope you're keeping well wherever you're tuning in from around the world. Hello to you from Toronto, Canada. Salam, Dustan Aziz. Durud Bar Shoma. Hello. Hello. We were just talking about before we uh, started recording here. Keanu and I were talking about how, you know, like in English, you just say hello, you know, <laughs> but in Persian, there has to be this drama to, hello. It's elongated. Hello. Like it's, <laughs> like it's, it's never just, it's never simple with the so Persian. Hello. You, you, know? Know, you know? Like shy, uh, like say you're picking up the phone. What do you say? Okay, yeah? right. You don't actually have to pick up a phone. Hello. Right, <laughs> <laughs> it's my yeah, No, no, no. I, I hear you. When you call sometimes the guests to get um, the sound right, I hear you going, Hello. <laughs> Hello. I mean, he's doing Hello. it's Shia, so Hello. it's like, Hello. <laughs> but it's Hello. always like, it's so dramatic. I think it's our culture. Just and then, of course, the relatives who are, have to. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> but you see, if your mom is talking to you here, like my parents are here now, when I'm calling them, they're, it's normal. <laughs> they're like, yeah, we want this. When are you going to be home? When they're talking to family back home, I know. It's always like, Hello. <laughs> no, I know. Shabby. That you have to increase the volume based on how far away the person is, despite the fact that it's the 21st century and everything. It's everything works fine. Uh, it's just old habits die hard. I hey, suppose. Sitara Atai, what what a journey this this person has had. I'm I'm very much looking forward to having a conversation with her. First of all, with the backdrop of everything that that's been happening in Afghanistan, it um, it's more more important than ever. It feels like to bring on uh, Afghan folks, uh, an Afghan. American accomplished person like Sitara, who's doing really well in in the acting world, Homeland and United States of Al, uh, uh, that has its season premiere in a couple of weeks. Uh, but sh- her backstory is she was born in Kab- Kabul. Uh, I, I used to say Kabul when I was mm-hmm. growing up, but then the, when I was at the CBC, they said Dude, you're supposed to say Kabul. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. But what do we say in Persian? Kabul. 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 Yeah. Kabul. Yeah. What? Kabul. Hello. 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 <laughs> Kabul. Kabul. Bull. Not bull. Bull. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Kabul. Shia. Kabul. 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 Uh, you know, Shia, like, first of all, uh, hello, the fabulous Kia. Hi, Jean. Hello, uh, Captain Reza. <laughs> yeah, and hello, God. Groovy Shia. <laughs> yeah. See, l- now he says hello, as I'm last week. <laughs> See the way he turned on me? Yeah, he he was like... That. Yeah. Hello, you know. He was mad at you. He <laughs> Shamshiro as Rubasti. Oh. Huh? Oh. That's pretty good, huh? Yeah, yeah. I've yeah, been yeah. waiting to use that one. <laughs> you yeah, how long the sword? are you sitting on that? <laughs> Shamshiro as Rubasti. Yeah. Well, now, Kiam, what do you think that uh, means? I just know Shamshiro's sword. That's so right. as Rubastam, like you Basti. As you closed it off. Close no, the no, <laughs> okay, tell me, what is Shia? Like what you're is facing he? him head on, like yeah. with a sword, ready for battle, ready for ah. battle. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes. Ah, Shamshiro as Rubastam. Yes. I don't know. Is that it, uh, that's a pretty good one, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah you see? Yeah. yeah. See where what I'm you, up to? Where do you get these from? I, <laughs> like, do you, like, I literally walk friends? the streets asking people. <laughs> I go to Super Chorak and I stop people. Can you can you teach me something that I can bring back to the show that impress my friends? Uh, impress is a pretty big word. I wouldn't so, go that so, far. So, so Sitara I grew up in Kabul, Ka- Kabul, yeah. Kabul. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and you know had this. There's this wonderful story I have to ask her about. About um, her parents owned a video store, uh, or like a a technology kind of store mm. that involved uh, VHS tapes and mm. things like that as well. You know, in Kabul. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Oh, when okay. she was in in Kabul, Kabul, yeah. <laughs> Oh and uh, <laughs> it's really, Will he ever really learn? not helpful at this point. So, um, uh, and and then they very sadly, you know, you know, events in, in Afghanistan led them to leaving. And she has um, had this nomadic. I mean, everyone, pretty much everyone, we bring on the show is some form of immigrant, first generation, second generation, have been all of us. We've lived in different uh, countries. Um, I mean, except for Keon, who's lived in Iowa and. Uh, <laughs> Weren't you born in London? <laughs> in Halifax. You're not. A, what are you talking about? <laughs> oh, I'm, an immigrant, I'm an immigrant from London. Okay. <laughs> from, from, anyway, so. He's saying as if he's listen to from like so Iran, and then she went to India with the family, mm. and then they were in Nepal and wow. Thailand and Netherlands. Holy. And then the U.S. So as a result of that, and as a result of her. A great industriousness. She she speaks fluently, like six or seven or eight languages. Wow. Um, really, really impressive, and and really understands. Brings to her acting. You know this, Captain Rezo. You're of an course. actor. Yeah. Brings her her own experience yeah. to this. Like it's a, uh, it's gratifying. This United States of Al is a is a sitcom. You know, on CBS uh, uh, about an an Afghan interpreter and an American guy. Um, and I think, you know, and, and she's got a lead role on it now, but it's nice to have somebody who's actually from Afghanistan and actually, mm-hmm. you know, understands the role. And it's, it's, it's gratifying to know that she's out there. Anyway, Sitara Atai will join us um, in just a little bit. Uh, we're coming to you on rookmedia.com. It's there that you can link to all of our platforms. You know, we're on this ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. One day in the future, mm-hmm. years from now, we hope that someone can look back on all these Rook episodes and have this kind of encyclopedia, mm-hmm. this oral uh, and video encyclopedia of of who Iranians were and are uh, living outside of Iran in, in this in this era and ongoing. It's beautiful. Yeah. Poetic, thank you, thank almost. you, thank you, Kian. <laughs> Added so much. To the it was program. so. I was going well until Kian made fun of our show. <laughs> I'm not. I'm being serious. Well, yeah, really I mean that's our mission wow, here. You know, like we're repeating our mission. Pulling at my heartstrings. Uh, we are on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Castbox. You can watch uh, what you're hearing. At least see some visuals on Instagram and YouTube. And if you like your Rook descriptions and bulletins in English and in Persian, check us out on Telegram. You can also become a patron of our show, which means uh, just helping us out grow this thing by pressing the support us button. Listen, if you're a regular listener of Rook, uh, at this point, we'd love you to become a patron. Uh, support us and then you for $5 and $10 a month. You become a patron and you get special things that we haven't determined yet, but we're going to send to you. We're going to be in the United Kingdom next week. Yes, Speaking of we London, will, yeah. we are going to be in London. Now, we're flying uh, me, Captain Reza, and Keon on Sunday night, yes. right, to go and shoot some interesting things in in the uk which we'll bring back to the colonies <laughs> and uh and edit and and put out there on our rook media platforms but we're leaving sunday night and we have a show on monday oh, yeah. so i think we're gonna have to pre-tape our show oh, yeah. so we're gonna have to pretend on i don't know do we pretend on monday's show no, that we're no we're, we're, so. just we're just gonna say yeah, we're, just out gonna with it. we're doing we're pre-taping this yeah. thing before we leave for the right. uk and if we wanted to pretend we shouldn't have talked about it on this show today, that's right so well i'm <laughs> removing the, the fourth back. wall yeah. captain reza <laughs> captain reza you know i had this meeting last night uh with a couple of prominent folks in the uh-huh. canadian iranian community and they're you know some somewhat older guys you know okay. Uh, and, and it was really nice to find out that one of them listens to Rook 
pretty regularly, oh, you know? Wow. Okay. And so, yeah, and he's like talking about episodes. Yeah, he's really into it. It was really mm-hmm. nice. And, and he says, ah, and he goes, uh, I love that guy. You are always talking to that guy. He's so sweet, you know. Shia? Uh, Shia? Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 you know. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm like, sweet yeah, one. Shia, Shia is <laughs> great, you know. And he goes, no, 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 no. The guy, <laughs> no. the guy who is so nice. I like to listen to him. And I'm like, <laughs> nice. Savvy Rohan? <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. And then I'm like, he's like, no, 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 no. He's regular, the guy. And I'm like, Bessa Balur, like, Kave <laughs> Madani. He's been on the show a couple of times. Like, guess. honestly, I couldn't, you know. <laughs> and wow. then. Uh, and then he's like, no, no, no. And I'm finally like, I'm like, it's like five minutes I'm trying to guess who this is. And I'm like, Captain Reza? <laughs> you know? He's like, wow. oh, Captain Reza, he is so good. I like him so. And I'm like, what? Like, wow. then, I, then I was like, maybe he's mixing up. He thinks Shia is Captain yeah, Reza, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, does he have kind of a voice like, oh, yeah, I, I once went to the. And he's like, no, 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 no. And I'm like, does he kind of talk like this? I uh, I can explain Saga Abi. It's uh, it, it looks like a dog and it goes in the water. Yeah, and, you know. He's like, yes, yes, yes. He oh is great. So a genuine fan of Captain wow. Reza. Wow. Yeah. There That's is someone that amazing. likes you out there. <laughs> and not even like one of the you know young young people who's smitten with Reza's right. um, matinee looks. idol looks. Yeah. No, it it's was like an older who, guy. He's like, oh, yeah, oh. that's the guy. He, I mean, can you imagine? I can. He tunes in to hear us, and Captain Reza oh, is his boy. favorite. <laughs> You know what's funny? The funniest part <laughs> of this story. This come to? <laughs> the funniest oh. part of this story is the fact that even I thought he was talking about Shia. <laughs> yeah, I'm right. like, sweet, nice. Yeah, well, that that's I, I mean, that, that was me. the first that threw me way off track. <laughs> you know, <laughs> hey, he's so sweet, and I'm like, track. okay, so that's Shia. Right. And then uh, and then it's, when he said no to Shia, I was like, okay, well, I mean, I didn't even <laughs> consider Captain Reza, right? Not even in the first ten. <laughs> I mean, oh. when Captain Reza, the last episode when we were trying to describe the <laughs> name for Abi. name for Beaver is Sagi right. Abi, and yeah. we're laughing at it because it's a literal right. translation. It's like dog of water, and he tried and to then, dis- and he's like, "Let me explain. I think they looked at it and it looked like a dog, and it looks like a dog that, and it goes in the water." And we're like, uh, "Yeah, thanks, Reza." It should be Captain thanks. Obvious. Yeah. <laughs> I think exactly. Obvious his name. Reza. And then there's these people. Oh, I love the Captain Reza. He's the best. <laughs> he's so sweet. <laughs> you see, there is yeah. something in that. I got Pfizer. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was just his mom. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I love you too. Oh, nice. oh, we so all love you, Captain Reza. We all love you. Oh, Everybody you. loves Captain Reza. Let's face it. I'm nodding. Yeah. <laughs> 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 A shout out to MyTerms.ca, Arash and Anita Fazilipur. They are life partners and business partners, and they're the founders of MyTerms.ca. This is a mortgage company in Ontario, Canada. They have a really good record with MyTerms.ca, focusing on the service aspect of the mortgage business, and they're very well reviewed online. They specialize in multi million dollar transactions through institutional and private sources and represent a handful of of wealthy private investors who focus on one to $10 million first or second mortgages. If you are a builder, developer, or a mortgage broker looking to team up with a great source, this company is what you need. Check them out online at myterms.ca or give them a call at 416-MY-TERMS. They make it as well a big priority to give back to the Persian community. Arash and Anita Fazalipur, myterms.ca. And also, uh, Big thanks to Farid Amerioun and York National Realty for helping to make this episode of Rook uh, come to your ears and eyes. York National Realty is a boutique real estate company, Shia, a mm. boutique real estate company mm. based in Aurora, Ontario, Canada. Have you ever been to Aurora? You've been to Aurora? Uh, I, yeah, once. I yes. Think there, yeah. I think we went to, uh, didn't, wasn't it Mehran's place up in Aurora? Oh, correct. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, so we got some musician friends who are up there, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's about a half an hour north of Toronto. Uh, and so York National Realty, boutique real estate firm, they provide top tier service with their team of Fadid, Sean Fadavi, and Nahal Sultani. They're a full service realty firm, uh, and they're there for everyone from first time home buyers to investors looking for new opportunities in the communities they serve. Farid and his team have also made it, made it their mission to give back to the Iranian community in the diaspora and have supported a number of Persian community events and projects. If you're looking for real estate, this boutique firm is where you should go. They provide personal service with flair and great attention. Try them out for all your real estate needs. Thank you to Farid, Sean, and Nahal, York National Realty, yorknational.com. So 
We go to the UK next week. That's right. Are you looking forward to it, Kim? I am. I think it'll be a lot of fun. Are you going to have some fish and chips with me? I mm-hmm. suppose we have to. It's a cultural thing to do it's Culturally there. mandatory. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's the uh, my English version of uh, Orma Sabzi. Yeah. Now, are you going to put on a British accent? Is that what happens yes, when will. you go there? That's correct, yeah. <laughs> you just no, go honestly, back to you will, though? <laughs> no. No, <laughs> of course I cool. won't. Uh, but I, but I, yeah, I, mean, I could. But uh, I, no, yeah, sure. I, I actually really, really don't like that. You know, when Madonna yeah, 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 has been yeah, living yeah. in England for a couple of years and suddenly yeah. she has an English accent, it really bothers me. <laughs> I don't know why it bothers me so much, but it bothers me. And Shia, uh, you're going to be holding down the fort here with Savvy Roham yes, and yes, parts yes, of the artist. Yes, and, yes. Yeah. Don't worry about here. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's we would if Captain Reza was, uh, was the one that had to <laughs> oversee. The Actually, I, I, I kind of worry about Shia. I mean, Shia, really? I mean, <laughs> Shia never remembers his keys. I mean, nobody's going to lock the place up, you know. I don't know if I lock <laughs> I need to... <laughs> Jesus Christ! I'm gonna, out there. I'm gonna <laughs> miss you here while, while I'm partying here. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that's right. Yeah, it's gonna come to back. This joint has completely yeah. burned down. <laughs> Speaking <laughs> of <laughs> joints, I mean, oh, <laughs> Shia yeah, is gonna be that's it's gonna be smoke filled yeah. in this office <laughs> while we're gone. We're gonna be in the UK, like uh, yeah. piously trying to get some work done for the. <laughs> I know. And uh, you know, Shia, Shia is again. back here. It's Savvy <laughs> Roham. <and, laughs> <laughs> Turn it into a rave. Uh, those two. I mean, can you imagine <laughs> no. with all oh, the facial a, hair and the two of them? <laughs> that'd be a weird party. Uh, and okay, so yeah, we're going to the UK. It's directionless, this program today. We're going to the UK <laughs> yes. because uh, we're going to do a number of interviews. We're going to do right. this. Uh, and we're working on this new series that we're actually shooting. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, Captain Reza, you've lined up the interviews. I've got the research ready. That's right. Uh, Keon. Is, uh, is also coming. <laughs> <laughs> so unappreciated around here. No. <laughs> Turning oh. me into a And we're going to the British Museum, right? Oh, that's right. That's, that's right, mate. Right. <laughs> we're going to go to the British Museum. They have some of the best Persian artifacts there, actually. They have this uh, the cylinder? cylinder of Cyrus. Mm-hmm. But wait a minute. You guys, you both of you have been to the to England, right? Yeah. Yes. Oh, have you? I haven't been, been to England. No. You've never been to England? Never been. Oh, really? oh my ah. God. I've been. So. Yeah. yeah, you told she me. Just, Shia has been there too. I haven't been. Resident I'm England I'm virgin, yeah. which is the virgin. only kind of virgin. Uh, <laughs> Reza <laughs> is. Uh, let's face it. <laughs> we should make him do a bunch of ridiculous things. Like in, you know, in in England, it's customary to uh, to put ketchup on your head and I don't know something ridiculous. Now Reza will be explaining things to us. You see, they call it fish and chips because this is fish, and they call this chips, and together it's fish and chips. You know, it's thank you, Reza. Oh, that's so exciting! I'm happy to show you London. Oh, I'm so excited! Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. maybe we'll go to my uh, my birth home. I want. I was to, born actually. in a house. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why? What? Not a hospital. I was not born in a hospital. I was born in a home. Were you an illegal wow. like birth or something? <laughs> that's right. Wow. Like, a that is small Mexican family <laughs> birthed me. No, I, I, I don't Why? know what that means. No, <laughs> what do you mean? I, but I why? But I mean, like, some people are born at home. Wait, was it planned yeah. that you would be born at I home? I think it was actually. Yeah. Really? Your mom yeah. wanted to. Yeah, she like, had a midwife. And okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Where were you born? 1920s? <laughs> yeah, honestly. <laughs> yeah, why? I want to know. <laughs> it's a vampire. Did, did, is that really weird? I, I don't nobody know. Nobody ever heard that before, unless like my grandmother. You've would never heard of that before. House, like I guess. Like, some people like to be born <laughs> at home. <laughs> She's been in the house. Uh, I think uh, I, you know, what, I don't even know. I think I was born in the house. Wow. I think I was Did born you ever ask your mom why? <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm trying to make sure I got the story straight. But I, yeah, I was born at like 10 o'clock at night. I think in between just watching, you know, <laughs> She's football like, or something. They had me in the house. They're like, wow. fuck it. We don't want to go to the hospital. <laughs> Let's just do it here. All right. Pop tired. it out. Honestly, oh I, think, God, I, I think it was wow. just like. They had other stuff to well, do, and they were like, "Why go to the hospital?" <laughs> do you still know where that house like is located? Yes, yes, oh, we got the go address. To the house. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Film that. No, I, I mean, I know the house that I grew up in, like when I was mm. when I was a toddler, and then there was another house too that when I was a, a little kid. But, um, but I think I was born in the house. Yeah, yeah, wow. I'm pretty sure I was born in the house. Wow. I think maybe I was early, mm. and so then it was like we don't have time oh. to go to the hospital. Oh. Gian wants out. Oh, you know, he wants to like. Seven yeah. months, huh? 
But you know what? You're right. I don't. I always thought it was cool. That you I was thought it was born normal? <laughs> Did you born it? I never thought that was weird. <laughs> I mean, but I never, I, I never investigated it. Maybe they didn't care about me. <laughs> right? <laughs> they were, just like, they okay. were like, "Why bother going to the hospital?" <laughs> yeah, this one didn't we, may, we, up. we may not keep this one. <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> we'll just try again if it doesn't. Depending work on out. what he comes out like, you know. <laughs> and then I come out with the big nose, <laughs> and they're like, "Ah." Oh. 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 Maybe we should give him a brother. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I have to call my mom. <laughs> That's my no, I want to know. Yeah. Wow. Huh. You know, where's, where's my phone? I mean, okay. I don't know if my mom's going to answer. I'm trying. Uh, okay, it's ringing. I don't want to put. I don't want to put her on. She's, you know, she feels weird about being on the on there without asking her. It's ringing. Hi, mom. How's it going? Okay. Oh, you're in the store. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Mom, I'm just recording uh, a Rook, and I was just telling them that um, we're, like, I mean, we're actually recording right now. Sorry. Uh, um, I was just telling them that I was born at home. Was I born at home? Yes, you were. Well, okay, okay. I was born at home. Why? <laughs> I was born with, <laughs> can I put you on the air? No. Okay. I, you don't want to be on the air. Okay, you have a mask on. All right, all right. Can it, but can, you're in the store. I know. I sorry, but can they, uh, ev- that was like really ajib for everybody. They were wondering why I was born. At that time, the second child in England, if everything was okay, only the first child would be in the hospital, and the second child was this the 1940s, <laughs> mom? <laughs> well, uh, no, I know I wasn't born in the 40s. I was joking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> my mom's explaining when I was born. <laughs> so, so okay, so a, a lot of people did this. They were born at home to, to not, uh, with a midwife, to not sort of tax the hospital system. Oh. Okay. And I was born around 10 o'clock at night, right? Okay. It was fantastic. Why was it fantastic? <laughs> As my mom says, at home it's much nicer. <laughs> you can watch the football game while you're giving birth. You can have tea after. Yeah, yeah, yeah you can have chai after, <laughs> and yeah. Um, okay, thanks, mom. That I appreciate that. Okay, bye bye. Bye. Wow. Let's look this up. <laughs> Children born at home in the UK. I mean, it doesn't sound I'm normal. Just look, I'm just looking this up, and there's a lot of, like, I regret my home birth. <laughs> <laughs> if you Google it, and people are just like, oh, I, I wish I hadn't been born at home. <laughs> home birth, co- colon, what the hell was I thinking? What? <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> this is terrible. Your mom seemed I to like it. I can't believe. Yeah, my mom was fine. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> then it says, in the 1970s, uh-huh. 80% of births in the UK were in uh, hospitals. So in other words, like I was, I mean. 20%. In, yeah. Before 1975, it was a lot more home births. That's the, my category. But but they were still, the majority were still hot. Like what was, what were they thinking, my parents? <laughs> They this just didn't want to make the drive. They're like, you know, the soccer game's on. The, Honey, let's just do it at home. All right. I, I can't. I, I, wow. I, my mom was still fine about it. She was like, oh, yeah, it was great. <laughs> I mean, what happened? You know, maybe that's what happened to me. Oh, my God. You know, like the deformities and stuff. The nose? My nose. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, my oh God. one in 50 births still in England take place at home. Wow. Many, many soon to be mothers preferring the comfort and familiarity of these surroundings. I think that was the case for my mom. She was Thanks to what she's in, she was just saying there. She liked, she was at home with a midwife. It was like it felt more comfortable somehow. Mm. But weren't they, weren't a case where the spouse wasn't allowed at the hospital to accompany the, their wife or whatever? There's something like that. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Home birth, why not? I'm looking at all the articles here. <laughs> Home birth back on the rise. Home births are far safer for U.S. newborns. Oh, 
hospital yeah. births. No, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Like, God it's... forbid if something goes wrong. You Like, I would I feel know. more comfortable in a hospital. Uh, let's see here. Oh, really? So I don't of know course. what happened to Jean. <laughs> uh, let me see here. Uh, the best thing is that after a home birth, I can shower in my bathroom. <laughs> my own bathroom i mean what is th- you know what oh. they put me at risk <laughs> by doing this how all right <laughs> <laughs> thank you shy <laughs> he's gonna like percentage of the home births in the u.s 2020 let's see what am i in the u.s anyway okay well there we go there you, you go. learn something new by yourself yeah <laughs> I didn't it took you that <laughs> long to ask wait. your mom. I, like, I didn't. Th- I didn't, th- I didn't oh. know it was that weird. I mean, I guess I never Until thought you about saw it. our faces. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> and then now I realize like I'm in some small percentage of weird people that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that, there's a club that I like for have you, guys. you know uh, probably like learning deficiencies. Or maybe <laughs> maybe it was a hippie thing back in the '60s. You I don't know, think my parents movies. were hippies. <laughs> they were Iranians in London. With my dad wore a suit to like <laughs> come to breakfast. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe they were happy with my sister who had come before me. Yeah. And this oh one God. was a write off. They were just like, Roll the dice you on know, this one. let's just do this at home and get it over with. Oh I don't know. God. Jeez. Are you going to be okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm a little shocked. To, <laughs> He's gonna I don't know if I could do this interview therapy. right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh. All right. Well, we'll figure it out. Uh, I think we did. <laughs> I think we did. So where were you born, Keon? What do you mean where was I, mean, I born? I know you were born in a, a farm somewhere in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> At least I was in a city. Hey, it wasn't my <laughs> p- choice, obviously. My, I don't know. My dad was doing his master's in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, where were you born, Shia? In the Kuchehaya? Where? <laughs> yeah, in, no, in, actually in a hospital. Uh. <laughs> Imagine if I want to born in home with uh. twin sisters. Oh, you have a twin yeah, sister? Yeah, oh, so it would be a difficult. You know. I'm thinking now nobody was born. Maybe I was the uh, only person. I mean, they say 20%, wow, but maybe, yeah. you know, yeah. that's... You're, the, you're probably the first person I've met that's I, been I'm born. the first person I've met, apparently. <laughs> that I don't know anybody else who was born at home. I mean, that I think my so parents didn't care. <laughs> oh, okay. That is so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, and now we're going to get a lot of people write to us saying, hey, I was born at home. I hope so. That made me feel better. And I curse my mother every day for it. (laughs) No, I'm kidding. I'm sure it was fine. It turned out fine. Hey, look at him. He looks like a healthy young man. Uh, In the coming days on Rook, uh, we're going to do Persians teaching English. We've got that coming up. We've got Sasan Behnam Bakhtiar, a great uh, abstract artist. Wow. Who's in France and has uh, quite a lineage going back in Iran as well. Really? Uh, who else we got coming up in the coming days? Uh, Vanessa Rudbaraki. Another yes. a very cool artist yes. who's also in France. Uh, exactly, yes, correct. And Tina Talibi. <laughs> you know, Tina and James. I do, The yeah. duo that are all the rage on YouTube and Instagram. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the the married couple, uh, an Iranian woman and a Canadian guy who is learning quickly to become, uh, <laughs> to speak Persian and do some pairing. Yeah. And uh, so Tina Talavi will be joining us for a feature interview coming up as well. All right, let's get to our feature guest today. Thank you, Captain Reza, Groovy Shia, the fabulous Keon. Stick around, we'll talk to you right on the other side of this. My feature guest today is an Afghan-American actress, model, choreographer, and former freelance journalist who makes it her mission to use her prominent platform to create change. She is passionate about addressing the plight of refugees and giving voice to Afghan women and children suffering in silence. All that, and you will likely recognize her from a fave TV series or two as well. Sitara Atsai was born in Kabul. Her family immigrated to India when she was seven years old. And then after a time in Nepal and Thailand, Sitara and her family made Netherlands their home. She obtained a degree in fine arts from the University of Groningen and worked as a freelance columnist and model in the Netherlands for several years. She participated in a variety of television shows and TV debates on minority issues. She also won numerous awards for dance and several beauty pageant titles and established herself as general manager of the Sekir Entertainment Service in Rotterdam. Sitara is now based in Hollywood and focuses on acting, modeling, choreography, and her professional dance career. You will have seen her on network television in prominent roles such as Samira Nouri on Homeland or more recently on Stumptown or playing Hasina 
on the United States of Al. She is undoubtedly busy, but right now, Sitara Atai joins me from Orange County, California. Hello. Hi, that is a very nice and long introduction. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the program. It's really nice to have you. I wasn't sure if it's the, is it the University of Groningen? How do you say that? It's so funny you said that. I was like, I will make that into Groningen. Oh, is that what it is? Groningen? <laughs> Uh, yeah, yes, well, the H is very prominent in Dutch language, uh, very similar to Farsi and Arabic. There is a very prominent H, so we're going to get into the the myriad languages that you speak in a in a few moments. I mean, you're pretty remarkable when it comes to your facility for language. Uh, listen, I, I want to get into your career, your story, or your languages, but I, I feel Star like I would be remiss if I if I didn't start by asking what what the world has been about what the world has been seeing playing out in in your homeland in the last month or two tell me about um first of all tell me about the emotions you have felt with the return of the taliban and the concomitant departure of american forces there i mean literally the past several weeks um the emotions have been overflowing it, it goes from just being sad and heartbroken to disappointed and just shock and disbelief of this truly happening because nobody saw it coming about a month and a half ago and the speed with which it happened it's just been so crushing to be very frank and honest uh, for all of us in particular for afghan women those in afghanistan especially and those here watching and feeling helpless not being able to do anything about it um, it, it's been a very emotionally draining and difficult time. It's been um, soul crushing that our flag, our country, the name, everything has been taken away from us. The culture, the music, the TV, television, filming, everything, everything, entertainment completely cut off, sports. It's just suddenly we're not just back 20 years ago. We're back back into the Middle Ages, which the Taliban prefer apparently. Mm. So it's been a very, honestly, difficult time. Do you still have family there? Or I suppose you'd have friends there or contacts there. But have you been... Unfortunately, I do have my aunt, her children and grandchildren there. And we actually tried to somehow get them out. But unfortunately, we were not successful. Right. Not everybody can get out. Um, no. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, we had uh, Sahrak uh, Karimi on, who, the filmmaker who made a dramatic escape her, herself. Yes. And, and yeah. we were talking to her about the fact that, I mean, it's very confusing to understand what to even, what position to take in all this. I mean, some of us opposed the war back in uh, 2001 in the first place, but obviously we opposed the Taliban. But then there's this been this push from the left to, to remove the forces from Afghanistan, but then you're leaving people to the whims of the Taliban. Do you, do you have a position that you take on what, what we or the world or America should be doing for Afghanistan? You know, this is this is such a good question that you're asking, because I ask myself this question, like, why am I so sad about the war ending? Right. Because one would think, well, a war ended. One should be celebrating. Right. Of course, it would have been a celebration if the war ended, number one, in a right way, in a better manner than it did. Number two, what happens after? What's the aftermath of the war ending? Is the aftermath that the country is left in better hands or is the aftermath that the country is left in the hands of the same people that the war was against for 20 years. And these people claiming, see in the beginning, I genuinely was hopeful when the Taliban claimed that they have changed and they will let allow women to at least go to schools and um, according to their principles, whatever that may be and things like that. So I was hoping personally that maybe it would become more of a, something like Iran, for example. Right. It is based on the Sharia law, a country based that governs by the Sharia law, but the women still have some rights. They do wear their um, chadors and they're covered, but they still work. They still live a life. Right. They still have parties at home. It's not our preferred like option, but it's it's better than the Taliban. It's definitely yeah. not preferred option. Preferred option was the Afghanistan that we have been seeing in the past um, 20 years rebuilding itself, showing the culture, progressing tremendously. We had an orchestra. We had women in sports that were just killing it. We had tons of female singers. We had movies being made in Afghanistan, actresses, actors, TV shows that were really well done. And so many um, 
Persian and Afghan artists being e- exchanged from Afghanistan to Iran, Iran to Afghanistan. There was so much good happening. And then you see it all just collapsing and just disappearing before your eyes. All the efforts of both sides, American and Afghan sides. I mean, think about all the military operations and CIA and God knows what all went into these 20 years mm-hmm. and all the lives lost for nothing, for nothing to go back to ground zero. It's just, I am, I'm a very spiritual person and I always try to look at the positive of things. Right now, I cannot see it. I'm very, um, very confused and very saddened and very, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I was hopeful that maybe the Taliban have changed, but based on what I'm seeing now, women are being whipped, Mm. tear gassed. Women are being told, the the music, sports, everything's done again. Like, what the hell? Mm. (laughs) Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, being hopeful about the Taliban would seem like a... um, um, P- perhaps naive or, or naive, or, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, yes. I, I, I'm uh, I'm sorry to even start the interview this way. It, it reminds me of um, you, you know being a a kid when the uh, revolution happened and in the aftermath, the hostage crisis, and and you know one of the reasons you would you know, my parents wouldn't want to, to tell people in Canada that we're Iranians just to have to deal with the questions, you know, uh, yeah. e- even if they weren't malevolent or angry or calling us terrorists, they would just be like, so what do you think of Khomeini? What's happening in your country? Whatever. Do 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 you feel that way right now? Like, do you lament the fact that people are probably constantly asking you about the situation, or do you welcome those questions? Honestly, for the first time in my life, all these years I had been feeling exactly the way you just described yourself feeling. I did feel like I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to talk about it because there was so much hurt and pain that was hidden in there that I didn't want to. But now in the past few years, honestly, it's like suddenly I've opened up and I want to talk. I just want to voice it. I just want to give it a face. And the reason why perhaps today I am focused predominantly on my acting career is that, that we need to tell the world and talk about it and show our pain, which I before was definitely afraid of and was hiding from. But now I'm at that point of like, no, that did not help anybody. That did not get me anywhere or help raise awareness. But talking about it showing and and expressing ourselves that's the way where we can raise at least raise awareness so that somehow some way somebody can do something about it yeah you had said that um when you played that role which really made an impression on homeland uh two or three seasons ago it, um and and the character you played samira nuri you said and i, I want to quote you in the process of becoming samira i had to visit parts of myself that really hurt i guess somewhere along the way i had forgotten how much afghanistan hurts um Th- th- this was obviously before the current return of the Taliban. What are you referencing when you say how much Afghanistan hurts? The thing is, as an immigrant, and in my case, I've lived in uh, five different countries, you just want to move on. You just want to let go of the pain and you just want to feel good for a change. And in doing so, while you do progress and you want to focus on Um, You know, as a young uh, woman, you want to focus on building a career, finishing your education, integrating into the new society, learning new things. And that was my focus. And whenever Afghanistan would come up, what I did was I was just showing the side of Afghanistan that people did not know, whether it was the clothing, the beautiful music, the dance, which I'm very passionate about, uh, Afghan folklore dance. Um, I did it that way. And it was nice. But there was the part of it that, that I was hiding hurt so much was because the name Afghanistan had become synonymous to a country that is war-torn, third world country, um, extremism, women being one of the worst treated women in the world. And that's something I had to distance myself from Mm. in order to survive because it just hurt too much to do anything with that. As a young kid, I was already dealing with uh, immigration stuff, so I couldn't do it. But then slowly, when you develop yourself and you feel more stable in life, then you can actually go and visit all the hurt and the pain and slowly start healing it, which was up until now. And now we are back to square one. You know, when you were a kid in Afghanistan, you, you, it was 
pre the coming of the Taliban the first time, and it was, uh, but it was still a war torn country. I mean, the Soviet Union. Uh, there was a war that had happened there. Uh, uh, t- tell me about Afghanistan. How you remember it? What was Kabul like in the 1980s for you as a little kid? Uh, I know your family owned an electronics store. <laughs> yes. So what what was that like? We I, I literally f- um, lived the life of a princess. We had we were living in joint family situation, but which was very common in Afghanistan with my uncles and their uh, families. But it was in like a palace. We had cook, we had a gardener, we had a lady who would clean, a lady who would uh, do the laundry. And I was so spoiled (laughs) that my doll's clothes were being tailor-made. Oh my God. Yeah. (laughs) Wow, okay. Um, My dad is like a phenomenal human being. He's a feminist at heart. So he never treated me any different from my brothers other than being treated better, perhaps a little bit. (laughs) Um, And then I remember fully well that I was, I loved going to school. Oh my God, I loved going to school. I loved doing my homework. Um, Life in Afghanistan was beautiful. It was during um, um, Najib. And because my parents had electronic store, what they did was not just sell electronic, um, equipment, but also they did. They had like the side business of doing videography for uh, family events, weddings, and <laughs> stuff, and <laughs> renting TV and VCRs for people to watch movies, right. including the movies. So our household was always like recordings was going on, parties. There were always movies playing. There was always lots of dancing. So my childhood, that Afghanistan, was something completely out of a fairy tale. It really was. And then suddenly, I will never forget how I came home. And about an hour later, my school was bombed. And my school was like a 15 minute walking distance from our house. And we went and we took shelter in the place um, to make sure that nothing would happen just to be safe. And when things calmed down, my mom took her chadari and she went. Um, she went to uh, see what had happened and she came back and shook her head and said, yeah, it was your school. She gave me the details later of how she had seen flushes of children Mm. hanging on trees. But after that, soon after that, my uh, dad and uncles all decided that this is the time to to leave. And unfortunately, once we left, that Afghanistan was wiped away and a whole new Afghanistan was created under the Northern Alliance. Right. So you you first go to India, where I understand that mm-hmm. uh, even though you you spent five years there and and you've you've left your homeland, you still were quote unquote living like a princess in India. This is yes. before you end up uh, via Nepal and Thailand going uh, in the, to the to the refugee centers of of Holland. First of all, tell me about India, and then then tell me about how a teenager copes with going from that lifestyle to being a refugee in in the Netherlands. Um, India was literally magical because, as I said, I grew up watching the movies, which were predominantly Bollywood movies. So for me, it was like going in the land of those movies that I so loved. The culture, the food, the colorful attires, music, movies. I was so happy. And sure enough, the the best thing that happened to me in um, India was my education, which was uh, most of the Afghan Afghans who migrated to India, they send their children to English schools because they knew eventually they want to move on and Hindi wouldn't be um, the language that would right, be helpful right. as much as English. So I went to school, everything was in English and um, outside of school, I loved speaking Hindi because it was just my, my language of love <laughs> since childhood. So India was a magical experience and what I got uh, on top of the English language there was my love for art and um, a platform to start expressing it because I would always have participated uh, in any talent shows that were local, any school events that needed dancing or singing or acting. I was always one of them who took part and um, typically won. So India was amazing. It was fantastic. Why did your family feel like they had to leave then? Because uh, basically my dad ran out of money because mm. there was no no work. There was no uh, prospect for him to build something. It was just whatever money he got out with him, we were running out of it. 
So the first next option was what to do. And most family members were like, well, we have to migrate to either Europe or America or Australia so we can have a better future for the children so they can, um, you know, have a safe and secure life. Right, right. Which right. India was temporary, uh, as great as it was. It didn't have any future for us. Where were you in India? New Delhi. Ah, you were in Delhi. You know, yeah. it's it, when we talk about immigration, I mean, I tend to... Um, I, I, I do consider it an advantage, a superpower to have uh, lived in different countries as a kid. And, and, and you know, I think there is a, um, a positive spin you can, you can put on it. You can see it as a positive, you know. Um, the, it's also incredibly difficult uh, for a kid to be transplanted and displaced as many times as you were. I mean, I'm counting there's Afghanistan, then there's India, then there's Nepal and Thailand, then there's the Netherlands. Now you're in the United States. You, you've you seemingly been quite magnanimous, or certainly you don't seem bitter about all of that. You've said that <laughs> all the immigration and traveling you did taught you a lot about our world. What would you say is something that you learned growing up moving that much? Well, it, it did teach me a lot because you just learn about how big the world is and your, um, your view of everything expands so tremendously. Now, that does not mean that I did not, that it wasn't difficult. Because up until India was still good and we were still together with the family, with the original um, extended families. But post that, slowly the, the realities of life started hitting from Thailand to Nepal. Those are very traumatic experiences. I don't want to go too much into the details because uh, long story, but um, being smuggled out of one country into another is never fun. It's very difficult. Right. And nobody leaves their comfort and home behind, you know, um, without being forced to. So, um, and then my dad, after after the my school was blown up, I mean, obviously their work and everything had started being a target for the from the political side of things because you know they were trying not to take any sides but at one point they had to take sides and if they would take side of one political party it was the other one coming after them so there was no there was really no way other than to escape um but what i did learn despite all the difficulties and everything you just become so aware that humans are in essence just all the same we, we hurt the same, we feel the same, we bleed the same. The cultures might be different, the languages might be different, but at the very core of it, that's the one major factor that I learned truly is how, and, and, and along the way, I get to meet not just uh, Europeans and Americans and Indians, but Persians, Africans, oh my God, people from around the world, because in those refugee centers in the Netherlands, there are people from everywhere. Hmm. And then you suddenly realize, oh, like, oh wow, it's just there's so much more to everything. There's different cuisines, different cultures, different music, and you start learning and liking and accepting, and you see how, um, you know, that there, there, there's so much more to the world. Did you face uh, discrimination when you first got to the Netherlands? Was, was it uh, <laughs> I mean, as a refugee? Was was it? I, I'm guessing it was probably the first time that you <laughs> realized that you were different from others in a, in, in a, in a sense. Uh, you, you might yeah. not have noticed that as much when you were in Afghanistan, obviously, or even in India. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Definitely. Um, I'll tell you a small story that has been <laughs> very um, challenging. It was challenging at the moment, and now looking back at it, I'm just like, wow, uh, thank God that passed. So in the refugee centers, first you go in the Netherlands, the first part is a one month refugee center, which is the um, Opfang center, which they basically receive refugees. And then from there, they disperse them into different other centers where you can um, end up for up to two years, some people even three years. So the second one was a different experience compared to the first one. Um, because there are, um, you're more settled, you get your own little bungalow with a kitchenette and you can have a bit of a life and there were lots of Persians and other Afghans, so you still feel a bit at home. But then after that, once we had to disperse further into the Dutch society, we ended up in a city where there were no other Afghans, no other, barely any other uh, people, foreigners as they called us, as we were called. 
we were the only family <laughs> that was hmm. of a different color, different culture, different language. I was at the beginning of learning Dutch, so my Dutch wasn't great. Um, and the first time I felt discriminated against was when I went to the swimming pool and I was not allowed to wear a swimsuit because um, my parents, obviously, they were like, oh, my God, my, our daughter, you know, I was 11-ish at that time. And I had to wear a wife beater and leggings. So that's how I went to the swimming pool. And two Dutch girls came to me and they were like, are you wearing this because you don't have a swimsuit? Because we have one for you if you want. And look, they were being nice, actually. But for me, that moment, oh, God, it felt, I felt terrible because I was always the center of the attention and so loved and my dresses were always complimented and I was all, always very fashionable if you will as a kid even and for me to get that comment I went crying to my parents and I was just like see I told you guys I can't go in there like this everyone's wearing a swimsuit why am I not allowed and and eventually my poor parents they felt bad and they got me a swimsuit. So the next day when I went, the two girls came back to me and they complimented my swimsuit. But it's funny, it huh? It's, it's not, I totally relate to that. It's not always the, I mean, we, we think about um, discrimination or feeling like an outsider or something like that. Usually we think of it in terms of a, a almost like in a, a cartoonish way of, of somebody screaming, you know, get out of my country the n-word or something like that you know and which which is we obviously that does happen as well but it's it's the real humiliation comes in little moments like this where yes. you're, you're like i'm wearing the wrong pants i've got the i don't have the swimsuit that the other girls have um you know, for me it was play, like you know realizing that i didn't know when i first we got first got to canada and i was i was different from the other kids i was trying to play hockey and and you know i just didn't quite have the right outfit and it was like and it was it was yeah. so humiliating, you know, and uh, and and th those little things that seem benign, but stick with you till now, right? A hundred percent, hundred percent, because it's as you said, it's the humiliation which is very internal. That hurts more than if it were an external attack on me, right? So then you perhaps physically feel it, and you're embarrassed out in the open. But it's the internal embarrassment and humiliation that hurts the most mm. and it goes to your core because that's when you truly feel like an outsider and i felt like an outsider for the longest of time in the netherlands because i was different i looked different and the, the, another thing was <laughs> oh my gosh a little boy in my seventh grade wanted to uh, be my boyfriend it was just very typical that every girl in class had one boy that was her boyfriend all they did was hold hands they didn't really do anything maybe write little letters so when he came to me and he asked me i was shocked and i'm like oh my god i'm not allowed my mom will kill me my dad will kill me but my mom especially so i was like no i can't do that i'm not allowed to for my culture and stuff so then what happened was the next day that same boy and his friend came to me and said, well, if you're not going to be my girlfriend or his girlfriend, then let's fight you. I was taller than them. Yeah, let's fight you. But what the hell? And I knew my teachers were well, not coming is the, to this save is the, me. Yeah, hardcore bargaining. You either my girlfriend. Can you believe that? Yeah, or we're, we're going to get a fist fight. Yeah. We're going to get a fist fight. I was like, what is happening? In Indian movies, it doesn't go like this. <laughs> so... I, I did fight them. I freaking had to fight them Both all. of them? And Why did you have to fight, or did you just fight the one kid? No, I had to fight both of them. Why did you have to fight two of them? <laughs> Good question. And then the referee was their friend, and he was giving them all the benefits, of course. But the only benefit I had over them, I was taller, so I did give him a bloody nose. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you, you want it? Then you're going to get it. I was being nice to you saying no because I not that I don't want to but I can't. Oh my god. Imagine so that kid now. I hope I hope he still follows you and he He like, does. He does. He found yeah, like so now you're cute. this glamorous <laughs> Hollywood star, you know. He does the poor guy who asked me out does follow me. The other one I don't <laughs> <go for. laughs> 
<laughs> That's amazing. Poor guy. He's like, he missed out. Well, he tried to be your boyfriend. I mean, what can he do? He tried. He was uh, sweet. That was actually <laughs> sweet. That's, yeah. What, what is all of that, this nomadic life? I mean, uh, you know, we t- every, almost everybody we have on the show is somebody who's an immigrant of one kind or another because we're, we're talking to a lot of people in the in the Persian diaspora, Middle Eastern diaspora. But, but, but I mean, you, you know, you sort of take the cake. I mean, you've got, you've been living in all these different places. What does that do to the notion of home for you? Mm-hmm. Like, do you, you know, when, when you're, say, a teenager or, or even now, I mean, what is your, you, you know, it's great. You've got all this experience. You speak, you're fluent in, I don't know, six, seven, eight languages. But what, what do you, do you even have a sense of what home is? Honestly, I lost it. I lost it along the way. And, and well, integrating into Dutch society was the toughest. The real most difficult one was my last integration into the American society because that was by choice. <laughs> and I knew what was awaiting me, but it didn't make it any easier. It really didn't. Because right when I felt I'm Dutch, boom, world changed again. My reality changed and I found myself here. So a sense of home, I, I kind of lost it because I was even going back and forth. My parents are still in the Netherlands, so I would go and visit really frequently because I just felt so unrooted again. Mm. So then I was like, I was searching. I really felt very lost. Um, I think it was the third year that I was here in the U.S. while I was going after my dreams and everything looked so perfect on the outside. Internally, there was a turmoil going on within me. So then I started searching for my home, like what is home now? So honestly, the only thing that helped me at that point was um, I found refuge in spirituality and the spiritual sense of the entire universe is your home. The whole world is your home and you're a citizen of this world. That concept kind of gave me some solace into understanding that, look, Afghanistan cannot be my home anymore neither can the Netherlands. I am planted in America, but I will never be an, a fully um, American in any which way. So so then what is my home? And that's when I went into a deeper understanding of, you know, like the world is your oyster and anywhere and everywhere is home. Why did you end up leaving the Netherlands? I mean, it sounds... By the sounds of it, from the outside, it looks like things were going pretty well there. You were doing this freelance journalism. You get a degree. Mm-hmm. You're, you're you're a choreographer. You win dance championships. You win beauty pageants in there, and the, the, the one in Turkey. I don't know what that was about. You went, you became a uh, you were a beauty queen in Turkey. What was that? Yeah, well, actually, I, I do want to talk about that because what happened was I I was reporting as freelance journalist on on how terrible the beauty pageant in the Netherlands was. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, th- and they said, why don't you enter? <laughs> Literally. I didn't know it was the, the person who was organizing it. He was the one who asked me, and I told him, I'm sorry, but this on a national, uh, international level is really bad. He said, then why don't you join? Because next year we're changing a lot. I was like, oh, well, that changed. But I was like, yeah, why not? I'll, uh, I'll give it a try. Oh, my gosh. And sure enough, the year that I participated, they made a whole reality TV show around it. I hated it. It was no fun. But um, the two finalists of each state basically got to go and continue the uh, pageant in the in Turkey in Bodrum, and there they had another contest uh, where they, based on talent, the person who wins would be Miss Baya Bodrum. And sure enough, the talent was in selling that hotel where we were staying at. It was the sponsoring hotel. Um, kind of like doing a commercial for it. And a lot of Dutch girls didn't speak English. And I, of course, was fluent. So I won that pageant <laughs> in <laughs> Turkey. <laughs> uh, but of course, there were girls who literally told me in my face. And that that was a very hardcore, direct, into-your-face kind of discrimination. They told me that they felt... I should not be part of this pageant. Obviously, I was intimidating enough for them to say this, but they said you shouldn't be part of it because you're not Dutch because you were not born in the Netherlands. You may have a Dutch passport. You may be a citizen now. You may pay your taxes and work here, but you were not born in the Netherlands, so I feel like you shouldn't be part of this pageant. Hmm. What did you, how did your parents deal with uh, from not letting you wear the swimsuit to having you uh, win beauty pageants? What? Were they okay with that? <laughs> So that was so difficult. 
honestly, it was not easy for me to. My parents were very supportive. There were people who were uh, extended family who would call my dad and say, oh, my God, we saw your daughter on TV and she's walking in her bikini. So you know what my dad did? The next week he called him up. He said, hey, episode two is coming up. Make sure you tune in at this time, at this time and my daughter will be in it. So while that support was there, and I so appreciate my parents. Oh, my God, they're angels. Um, when I had to do the finals and my dad was there and I had to walk in my bikini, I had asked him to please close your eyes when I come out in my bikini because that's still weird. Even even for any girl, I would think, any part of the world, walking sure. in a bikini in front of your dad is like no fun. <laughs> so, yeah, it was not easy, but I did it. And um, I feel I was discriminated overall in the pageant because um, the fact that I didn't win and the people who won, there's a lot of politics there too. I still feel it was not just because I was Miss Bayer Bodrum, I won the talent round and I was good with sports and I was one of the well-educated ones, but I still didn't. So there was, there was something there, but it was a traumatizing experience. I wish I had not done it, but Hey, but but tell I, tell me about the yen to to leave uh, again to the the so, Netherlands this time because by the sounds of it again you're you're now I know you were very you're you were involved in a very successful entertainment company you were marketing Bollywood films or something you were you had done some journalism you were winning dance competitions you were the beauty queen I mean you know from the sounds great. of it yeah. Sitara has done well in Netherlands and uh, yes, Netherlands yeah. has done well with Sitara so so why leave and go to America. Honestly, I would say half of it is kismet, it's destiny, mm. and the other half is when I, um, so I have lots of family here, my grandpa, my uncles, I have lots of family, and we would always come and visit California. So the first time I came and visited here, I was 17, and I just fell in love with the weather, which was in contrast to the Netherlands, of course, beautiful, sunny, and there was a sense of the Afghan community here was big and very um, very modern and very educated and very different than the Afghan communities I'd seen in Europe and elsewhere. So I wanted to be a part of it. Now, I didn't know I would actually make it happen, but I kind of decided for myself, by the time I'm 25, I'll be living in the US and I'll be doing... I didn't know I'd be working in Hollywood, but maybe it was a silent desire of some kind and it pulled me here. Um, but but the way things worked out, <laughs> it was exactly at my 25th that I ended up in the U.S. And I also found my uh, other half. And it just happened. I re really did not think that. And I also didn't think I would be the only one. I thought, I'll come here and soon after me, my brothers, my parents will come too because most of our family's here anyway. But man, life has ways. Life works in such mysterious ways. It all turned out very different, but um, but it was just just meant to be, I guess. Other half that being a, a life partner. Yes, my husband. And was he is was he Amer is he American? He's um, or, born and raised in America, but he's Afghan descent. Oh, he's Afghan, Afghan as well. Descent. All right, yeah. so you found okay, you came home to a certain extent. Uh, uh, an Afghan American yeah. married to an Afghan American. Well, I was at that point not an Afghan American. I was just Dutch Afghan right, <laughs> marrying right, an right, Afghan American. Right, right, right. It is different, you know. It's very funny. It's like a Persian who grew up in the Netherlands and a Persian in America is very different. Yes, it, yes. We have different yeah. mentalities. So. Yeah, we've talked about that a lot. We we well, we share commonalities in the diaspora, we, but we also share, and depending on how long you've been out of Iran and and yeah. you know the kind of immigrant you are. Yeah, I mean, it's there's uh, for sure there's there's differences. Uh, so, talk to me about um, typecasting, about being an, an Afghan American uh, actor, because um, one of the cool things about your your resume at this point, if you look at you on IMDb, that I don't think we would have seen with an actor like you, maybe say 15 years ago, is that 
some of the prominent characters you've played are actually Afghan characters. In other words, uh, um, you're not, you, they're not necessarily you having to play a, a, an Hispanic woman or, you know, something mm-hmm. that isn't, you know, uh, who you are necessarily. Um, that said, uh, we've talked a, a fair bit about the, the dearth of roles, you know, for um, Iranian actors, for Afghan actors. Aziz Zadeh has been on the show talking about that. Maz Jabrani has talked about that. Um, d- did you find that challenging at first? Like, okay, now I've landed in Hollywood. What do I get to play? Yes, because I really did. I still don't see myself as just Afghan. Because of my life experiences, I'm Afghan, I'm Dutch, I'm American, I'm Indian. I'm so many different things to myself. But my perception, because I was born in Afghanistan, for Hollywood, and Hollywood still remains Middle Eastern, Afghan, typical, stereotypical, And I had issues with that until I realized one thing. From amongst all those races, the most underrepresented one is Middle Eastern. And from within that, it is Afghan. And I had issues growing up seeing an Afghan woman represented on television or movies that actually was Afghan. There never was one. It was always somebody else playing an Afghan. And I... I kind of did not like that. I was like, but we have actors, we have Afghans. Why isn't right, an Afghan right. woman playing an Afghan woman? Right. And I mean, I never thought it would be me doing it. But then I slowly started realizing that, okay, whether if Hollywood stereotypes me or not, what do I want? And how does that impact me? I want to give a face to the faceless behind the burqas. I want to voice the voiceless. And the most voiceless, the most faceless right now in the world are Afghan women. So if not me, then who? Mm. And then my entire perception of this whole stereotypical thing changed. And I was like, no, it is my purpose. It is my mission. And I'm not only honored and privileged, but I want to represent Afghans. Now, that doesn't mean that's the only thing I want to represent. I've played some uh, Indian characters, and that's a lot of fun. It's kind of like a way to balance the intensity of the Afghan characters I play (laughs) with the more fun Indian ones. So I'm always open to playing um, people from different parts of the world that could easily pass for Hispanic or um, even Asian, Central Asian, and whatever, a Persian, Arabic. I actually did an Arabic role, smaller role in True Blood as an Arab woman. But my mission in my life, my purpose is best served when I f- give face to characters who are of Afghan descent. Uh-huh. But, you know, let me turn it around just for the, the fun of it, which is to say, is it in some way the hardest to play an Afghan character? Because if I, you know, if you're, if you're to be cast as, as um, uh, let's say we put Sitara Atai, uh, you, it's, you, you're going to play Othello, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. you, you get to be an actor, you know, you're playing yeah. a role. I mean, in Homeland, you were playing an Afghan character uh, opposed to the CIA, making deals with the Taliban. Uh, I mean, this is stuff that's in the news, in the moment. Um, this is, this is y- in a way, you're not just playing a role. You are representing there. Uh, and I've and I've got to think that that feel would come with a lot of weight of responsibility. It does, and it's ve- there's this dichotomy there because on the one hand, it's your art as an actor, and you can place yourself in anyone's shoes, right? That you're um, playing in that moment. On the other hand, it's so close; it's not personalized anymore. It's personal. However, if I were an actress in Afghanistan and I would be playing in shows or movies, I would play different women in Afghanistan who are very different from each other. They're all Afghans, but they're very different human beings. Mm -hmm. And it's the human experience that you're in the end showing on screen. So with that, it became um, a little better for me to handle when I got to the point of like, okay, as human beings, all these women who are of Afghan descent are not the same. They're different human beings. You look for the differences within the characters that you're playing. Is it difficult for me as an Afghan woman because the pain and the hurt feels so real and it's so deep in my heart? Yes. But that also gives it more, that makes it more true. 
and authentic, which hopefully comes across that way also for the audience, because in the end, that's what you want. You want to hit them in the heart. And if you feel it, if you feel it 200%, then guaranteed the audience will feel it at least 100%. Do they ask you when you're on Homeland, what do you think this Samir and Nuri would do in this situation? Or do they kind of give you the no. script? <clears throat> they gave me the script and they had actual um, cultural advisors who uh, were raised in Afghanistan and who would give them um, input based on what their experiences were, what they had seen, they, ha they were seeing in that moment. They actually had people on ground in Afghanistan. There were even several actors that were flown in from Kabul to Morocco to shoot for Homeland. Um, so, so while they didn't ask for my input, my training, my belief in my art is such that what I have to say what my personal opinion is, I can always express through my art, regardless of what the script says. Hmm. That's my um, artistic belief. And that's exactly what I got to do, thank goodness. You know what's, Granted, weird, what's, what's kind of crazy is that, that uh, wh when was it, about two, two or three seasons ago, right? That, or or th no, two or three years season. ago, I mean, it was the final season, but it was, it yeah, was final yeah. season. Uh, but it was, it was actually, I was, I was thinking about it, I mean, it's sort of prophetic what happens with you, yes. <laughs> you know, is basically what has happened. I mean, the question of whether the U.S. should be dealing with the Taliban and everything, and and Carrie Matheson, Claire Dane's character, is saying, "Well, we don't have a choice; we have to do." This. I mean, and and you're opposing it, and you're saying they killed my husband. I mean, it's very weirdly reminiscent of of what is going on right now. In fact, it was so weird as we were shooting. Sometimes they were little tweaks made to the script because of whatever was happening in actuality in Afghanistan. And it's really interesting how I basically say to the Americans, get out of our country, leave us alone. I mean, seriously, I didn't mean it. Right, <laughs> it right, right. A little too serious. They heard you. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, there is that sentiment is there. Look, it's not like they were there to freaking build the country. I don't, I don't see that anymore. I used to, but they were there for whatever their reason was. But the people there were were affected by it also negatively. There were people killed. And, and even at one point, Claire Madison goes to the graveyard of all those people that she had put a drone on and mm. she sees the graves. I mean, you see the consequences of your action at that point. So they showed it. It was really pretty courageous of them to actually show it. But at the on the other hand, it's just you. We never saw nobody saw this coming that they, it would be handed back to the same people you fought it off from, right? The issue is not that they left. It's great that they left. Nobody wants their country conquered by anyone else. They want to deal with their own stuff, their own politics. But the problem is that it fell in the hands of the right, wrong people, unfortunately. Let me ask you about the United States of Al. This is the. Uh the sitcom that uh, you've been involved in recently. Uh, uh, it's a sitcom about a friendship between a Marine combat veteran and American and his Afghan interpreter who's now come to the United States to start a new life. And his name is Al. He's the lead character in the United States of Al. The, uh, one of the co-producers of this is actually Reza Aslan, the uh, mm -hmm. Iranian-American. Uh, the, the series did quite well in its first season. Um, given the events of the last couple of months, I mean, the, the U.S. withdrawal, the subsequent fallout, the return of the Taliban, is it is it going to be harder to find humor or levity in a situation for, for now? I mean, on a, on a sitcom? Here's what I would like to tell you. Uh, there are actually a few articles about it uh, that's been published, I think, last week. Season two, the premiere episode of United States of Al is rewritten completely as a response to what has happened in Afghanistan. October 7th, I would say, watch the season premiere of United States of Al. It is gonna be a good response or a response to what is happening in the moment in Afghanistan. Are you involved in it? Are you gonna be in it? Yes, I am in uh, episode one of season one and, and, and it's a pretty, it's a pretty remarkable thing what happened there on set, honestly. We uh, finished shooting last week for that episode and oof, what an experience. Uh, the producers were all there. It, it, it's just, um, all I could say is I would urge you to watch it. It's gotta be tough because 
Uh, I mean, there's been some poignant moments on the show. I've been watching it. Um, but it's still a sitcom. Like you still have to serve the purpose of, uh, uh, presumably of, you know, making people laugh on a Thursday night or whatever. Uh, so it's gotta be a, a, a weird one for the writers and the producers to, to, to navigate. Look, when you have a huge group of brilliant creatives, such as Reza Aslan, um, such as brilliant producers like Maria Ferreira and Dave Ghosh, you come up with some crazy creative ways of doing what you need to do. Let me ask you, it's really great to get to talk to you, by the way. And, uh, and I appreciate your, you. your insights. I appreciate you sharing uh, all that you've shared, including the, the fist fight with the, the two boys. Uh, <laughs> who, <laughs> Fuckers. <laughs> You you did a let me end with this. I mean, it, because it kind of I love that you've done this because it really seems to sum up all the things that are you. You did a YouTube series or you you, know, you still do one called the United Nations of Sitara, where, <laughs> where you're a few different characters and you're speaking in a few of the different languages that you speak. I mean, uh, I mean, there's subtitles because there's the one girl that is speaking Farsi that I understand. And then there's you, the American. And then there's the Dutch girl and there's some DJ who's speaking out or German or whatever. Uh, is there... When you do that, um, uh, is there one of those characters that feel more authentic to you, or are you the composite of all the the different roles you're playing? I really am the composite of the different roles because it's just little bits of me. You know, I can't say that one of them is me because that would be very untrue. You just, as you go through life, you know, you just acquire more, and it's like layering on top of layers and acquiring more and more and becoming this new person every time and you get one more person one more language one more culture one more everything so i couldn't say but i can say that uh one of the most fun characters definitely the indian one because she's so she is funny she's very <laughs> typical auntie <laughs> yes yeah. um and the, the uh, middle eastern character which is afghan slash iranian um She's, she's the typical. She's Sitara John. So funny. Yeah, she's, yeah, the Sitara yeah. John. <laughs> she's the typical aunties we, we were with, the Khalas that are, you know, they have children, but they're very opinionated. They're very, they're very proper, you know. Um, but but they are also very, uh, very smart women, very intelligent women. And then the Dutch DJ, of course, Holland has produced some of the best DJs in the world, Tiesto being one of them and so many others. Right, right. So I could not uh, not do that. And the Dutch is very, you know, uh, nonchalant kind of. And then the German, of course, with the German history of Second World War. <laughs> I could not leave that out. Because uh, while living in the Netherlands, I would visit Germany a lot. We had lots of family there. And um, I studied German at school, so I spoke the language. So we would go to Germany very frequently. So Germany was very prevalent in my life, too. So and then the American Californian brand name crazy girl <laughs> <laughs> see i figured that was the you that was the you character and these were the layers of the onion you've shed uh the other characters but it does make sense that you also they're they're all inside you as well the they're all Khale yeah. and the, yeah the, the indian <laughs> auntie and everybody um Sitara, I tell you, I've, I've very much enjoyed this. I look forward to seeing the season premiere of United States of Al. Thanks Thank for taking you. the time. Uh, um, thanks for 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 the the difficult conversations that we have to have about Afghanistan right now. And uh, and obviously, we all hope that somehow um, <laughs> I don't know if the world turns around. Um, but um, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. And thank you for making your platform available for voices like mine. I certainly appreciate it too. And this was a fun conversation. Thank you. Khodafis. Khodafis. Bye-bye. Sitara Atayi, an Afghan-American actress, model, and choreographer. Look for her in the second season of The United States of Al on CBS Television, which is set to premiere on October 7th, uh, the second season. Sitara Atayi joined us from Orange County, California today.
All right. The microphone's back on for Captain Reza, Groovy Shia, and the fabulous Keon. Uh, you know, uh, Shia, that, that uh, we often talk about the trauma that Iranians have been through mm-hmm. and the difficulties and and all the, the sort of atrocities and tragic events that Iranians have to contend with, particularly in the last half century. Mm-hmm. And then when I hear stories about what Afghans have been through, I oh. think, you know, Iranians have had it lucky, mm-hmm. you know? I mean, uh, there there's just nothing worse than the stories of of the you know life under the Taliban or or what Af- uh, Afghan people have had to deal with in in the last in for a long time actually yes, not just the last few really decades. It's really heartbreaking, really heartbreaking, and it it never stops. That's very sad, you know. Every like decade, something new happened, and 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 to be honest, the story of Afghan people, like I didn't, I didn't, uh, I I say this with some shame, but even before we started doing Rook, I didn't know the treatment of Afghan people in Iran, like the institutional Uh, treatment where they don't, you know, have the same uh, opportunities in school and mm -hmm. things like that until we did the Sonita uh, interview. And I was like, really? That's, there's just like blatant racism Mm -hmm. in the system in Iran where, you know, Afghans don't have the same rights. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, there's that moment uh, when Sitara was saying, there's that quote from her where she says, you know, that that homeland character brought back the hurt Mm -hmm. of Afghanistan Mm -hmm. for her and I was saying would but you were there pre the Taliban so it it, and and you you realize that you know uh, as bad as the Taliban are it's it it's not like it was rosy before that you know it's 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 just been a tough tough place to grow up in and and to be from and, and yet a beautiful culture that she's um, doing such a great job of representing beautiful culture and beautiful talented people like with all this oppression and 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 limited access to to resources we had Sahara Karimi the first and only um, uh, women with PhD in film we have Sitara we have Sonita like all these artists not, not you can only imagine if they had Farid actually, Zolan, Farid Zolan oh, like yeah. to, to, uh, obviously and you can only imagine if they were actually be able to live in a country, their own homeland, yeah. Yeah. Uh, then had the freedom to to create and produce content. Like uh, yeah. uh, sky would have been the limit for 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 Afghan people. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Anyone who's doing or like Ozzy Tokhani Zadeh, like Zitara, these these yeah. people who are doing great things like Sitara have had to uh, overcome. And I liked how she was very candid about. You know, she she didn't necessarily grow up super poor. I mean, she mm-hmm. said, "Look, at, I was like a princess in the yeah. you know we had kolfats mm-hmm. and we had you know we had uh, help and things like that when I was a little kid." But but um, uh, nevertheless, the, uh, the 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 migration, the nomadic existence to go from country to country to country to country and and uh, and to end up being where she is now. And uh, um, I mean, I I don't. I hope she wouldn't take this in a patronizing way, but I'm very proud of her Mm. to, you know, do this, everything she's done uh, and continues to do. So there you go. I I like the idea of, I mean, this is one of my fantasies. I mean, the greater Iran, you know, like Afghanistan, Mm. Iran, and Tajikistan, Mm. these three countries that speak Farsi, they come back together again and yeah. mm-hmm. create a greater Iran. And yeah. 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 Really it's like and maybe a leader named Cyrus the Great. <laughs> 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 it's just really unfortunate <laughs> when <laughs> you have foreign intervention completely destroy a country from within, but mm. yet the culture and the people remain the same. Like some of the most successful, incredible, interesting people I've met are Afghans, whether mm-hmm. in yeah. Toronto or LA. Mm-hmm. And I, like I, I felt ignorant when I met them because you know you look at Afghanistan in the news and you mm-hmm. assume, oh, they're all like, the, uh, this is horrible, but you all, you assume that they're like these people that are portrayed, but then you meet them in prison, you're like, oh my God, you're so progressive and mm-hmm. you know yes. educated and interesting. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's a shame, uh. it's a shame. So you mean there's times that you don't feel ignorant? (laughs) 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 I'm talking about years ago Uh when I just, I wasn't, I didn't grow up with Mm -hmm. a lot of Afghans, but uh, when I got older, when I traveled more, I met a lot of like incredible people that just happened to be 
from Afghanistan. Hey, listen, uh, we, a big thanks to uh, Farid Amirion and York National Realty uh, for helping make this episode of Rook possible. York National is based in Aurora, Canada, not too far north of Toronto. The owner is a guy named Farid Amirion. This is a boutique real estate brokerage company that provides top tier service from first time home buyers to investors looking for new opportunities in the communities they serve. Farid has also made it his mission to give back to the Iranian community in the diaspora and has supported a number of Persian community events and projects. And this episode of Rook is brought to you with some support from him and his team. A big thank you to Farid Amarion, York National Realty. If you want uh, real estate, they're the folks to go to, yorknational.com, yorknational.com. And, of course, a shout out to Anita and Arash Fazilipur, the founders of MyTerms.ca, a successful mortgage company in Ontario, Canada. They believe in educating their clients to understand every aspect of the financing being obtained, and they see each transaction through from the beginning to end to make sure that they're closed with ease. If you're looking for a mortgage in the Toronto or greater Ontario region, go to to myterms.ca. They are among the best. Both Arash and Anita make it a priority to give back to the Persian community, and they are very well reviewed online. Big thanks to them, myterms.ca. All right, Keon, you ready? You packed? You ready to go on the weekend? No, I'm gonna, I'm a last minute packer. It's gonna be a Sunday night for me. Oh wow! <laughs> like maybe hours, really? like an hour before the <laughs> like. The really, pressure. I would have thought you'd yeah. be somebody no. who'd be like yeah. ironing your you know clothing. No, I'm and a procrastinator. All right. Oh, yeah. that's yeah. What about problem. you? Are you ready? Uh, well, we have to r- record the show, and I gotta get a bunch of stuff done. We gotta get tests done. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Did right. you guys book yeah. by the way your tests? Oh, we, t- we're th- let's, we can do some of this off the air. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I'm ready for the party. I yes, think. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but I, 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 I'm already thinking about, you know, the greatest thing is when you get into the groove of, I remember when I was touring all those years or when I traveled a lot for work, you get into a groove of, traveling and you know the five things that you take mm-hmm. you know Too these are the five fresh, t-shirts i take these yeah. are the this is the the pair of shoes that i always take mm-hmm. and yeah so i gotta get back in that groove but yeah, yeah. yeah. a week is a tough one in the uk because because you, you can't you can't sort of you know you can't get by with two outfits you know it's definitely mm-hmm. you definitely got to bring a a full yeah. And the weather, what, well, that's the other thing. Like, I haven't checked the that's weather. The thing, it's going to be fantastic. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Folks in London, we're coming for you. We're coming. Persians taking over. Uh, thank you, the fabulous Keon, Groovy Shia, Captain Reza, and the whole team. This is Full Time for Rook for today. Our website, rookmedia.com, is where you can find all things Rook. Rookmedia.com. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together each week. Producer Susan Ponta, the artist, the fabulous Keon, Super Patty Saw, Thoughtful Nagin, Savvy Roham, Ahaya Marathon, Sponsorship Sean, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shia. Thank you to all of you out there supporting us and sharing our content. So if you're listening to this on some platform right now that you have not subscribed to, please subscribe. It's free. It helps us and it gives you a little push to make sure you're getting our new episodes when they come out each Monday and Thursday. You can find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi, Facebook as well. Looking forward to seeing you. Talk to you soon. Mizubashi. Mizubashi.